Welcome to Men Alive, a biblical journey to help us become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. I'm your host, Paul Estabrooks. Our teacher is my longtime friend, Dr. Jim Cunningham, consultant in adult education and director of Go Teach Global, Dr. Jim. In the traditional Western family, there was a husband and a wife who usually fell in love, got married, and had children in that order. That's the way Diane and I did it, as well as you and Rita. We are now called biblical traditionalists. True, but some men listening today have never met their biological father. He may have died, or divorced their mother, or be in prison. However, if you never met your biological father and mother and you are still alive, then someone nurtured you and helped you survive childhood. These we call your parents, and in most cases, parents are also your father and mother. As we mature, there is a transition from obeying the direct authority of one's parents as a youth to giving respect, appreciation, and honor to your father and mother as one becomes an adult. The relationship between a son and his father strongly influences the son's relationship to God. If a son rebels against his father and mother, it is unlikely he will honor or submit to the authority of God or accept God's will for his life. Relationships in the home can affect relationships with our Heavenly Father. Proverbs are very clear. It says, The eye that mocks a father and scorns or refuses to honor a mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out and the young eagles will eat it. Proverbs 30, 17. Ouch. I have been in three different towns when news came of a young teenage son whose life ended in tragedy. Two were single motor vehicle accidents. One was a suicide. All three sons were in an apparent state of rebellion against their parents. Nowhere does scripture say we have to understand our parents and or even enjoy what they tell us. A wise father trains up a child in the way he should go and leaves the results to God. I remember wanting to teach my three-year-old son his first memory verse in the Bible. Thinking I was a very spiritual father, I chose Colossians 3.20. It says, Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. As you know, Paul, my wife Rita has a brilliant sense of humor, so she said in front of our son, that's okay to have David memorize verse 20 as long as you memorize verse 21 as his father. I read the next verse out loud. Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. We laughed together and carried on. A few days later, I corrected my son for something, and this little three-year-old looked at me and said, Daddy, you're making me discouraged. Knowing Rita and your son, I can visualize that scenario. I like that parallel, Jim. Obey parents, honor father and mother. From long ago, I remember that proverb that said, The eye that mocks a father and scorns a mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out and the young eagles will eat it out. Mocking one's father and scorning one's mother is not a wise decision. Let's consider what's involved in the Ephesians 6-2 command, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. First, we accept that no father or mother is ever perfect. Scripture says all have sinned and come short of the grace of God. Humanly speaking, there are no perfect fathers and mothers. We accept our father and mother first as human beings made in the image of God, and second as the divine timekeepers causing our birth in the fullness of time. We were born in God's meticulous sovereign plan on His timetable, not ours. We honor them for the sacrifice they made to have us as their child. And second, we honor our father and mother by finding creative ways of providing for their needs or honoring their name. 
King David did this when he asked, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And third, we plan affirmations appropriate to the needs and to the personality of our father and mother. This may grow to include letters, calls, visits, gifts, assistance, prayer, or counsel. Every son at some point fights the battle of wills, and every parent is on the front line of testing for their children. If a man learns to obey his parents, society wins. If he fails to obey his parents and transfers that disobedience to other authorities, society loses. He becomes a rebel, and the rest of us in society have to pay for his rebellion, disobedience, lawlessness, incarceration, and rehabilitation. Disobedience is costly. It leads to the destruction of property, loss of life, and loss of personal inner peace. Eli was the spiritual leader of Israel in the book of 1 Samuel. Yet it says in the second chapter, the sons of Eli were worthless men who did not know the Lord. Verse 12. In essence, they were good for nothing. They said to the worshipers, give us the best meat, and if not, I will take it by force. So they were bullies. They despised the offering of the Lord, verse 17. So they were arrogant, and they lay with the women who served at the tent of meeting, verse 22. So they were promiscuous, and they would not listen to the voice of their father, verse 25, disobedience. What a tribute His sons were good for nothing, arrogant, promiscuous, disobedient, bullies. Then God told Samuel in a vision, I am about to judge Eli's house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. Each of us as a son has a responsibility to obey our parents. It is for our good and their edification. Our obedience to our Father permits Him to extend spiritual leadership to others. Titus was told to appoint elders who have children who believe, not accused of excessive wild living or rebellion. Jim, one author I know refused to write a book on raising children until he saw his grandchildren walking with the Lord. Then he felt he would have some insights to share with others. Paul, speaking of grandchildren, you and I once had the privilege of visiting an elderly couple in China called Fanny and Charlie. They had lived in the same tiny one-room second-floor flat for 57 years. In this room, they raised four sons. Fanny cooked meals in the hallway outside, and the family shared a toilet down the hall with other families. During the Cultural Revolution, Fanny survived profound persecution for her faith in Jesus Christ. She showed us the bald spots on her head where the Red Guard pulled out hair to make her confess the names of Christians she knew. Chairman Mao was to receive thanks for the daily food they ate, but Fanny hung a sign on their wall that said in English, Christ is the head of this house. Eleven years later, Fanny and Charlie had gone to their reward in heaven. My wife Rita and I were on a tour in China, so I took Rita to see where Fanny and Charlie used to live. We met their youngest son named Paul. He had inherited his parents' flat and upgraded it with new flooring, air conditioning, refrigerator, stove, and a toilet. We met Paul's 21-year-old son, Jimmy, who was studying at university to become a lawyer. I asked Jimmy if he remembered visiting his grandparents' flat when he was 10 years old. He did. I asked if he remembered the sign his grandmother had on the wall that said, Christ is the head of this house. His response was polite, but curt. My grandmother had a sign that said something like, God bless you, everyone. But Jim, you need to know, I do not share my grandmother's faith. His words drove into my heart like a dagger. That's how fast we can lose our Christian heritage. 
The first generation, the grandparents, Fanny and Charlie, were vibrant, committed Christians who had endured horrific persecution. The second generation, the children, son Paul and his wife, were indifferent, secular, humanists, committed to the good life of materialism. And the third generation, grandson Jimmy, had become an active, professing, agnostic, committed to intellectual individualism. God's plan for the family, society, and the church requires each of us as sons to obey our parents and honor our father and mother. There is no apparent correlation between culture, economics, education, even birth order, and obedience in a child. I have met children in poor families and wealthy families who choose to obey their parents. I have met sons of illiterate fathers and university graduates who honor their father and mother. Whether you are firstborn or tenthborn, obedience is the responsibility of the parents to teach and our role as sons to learn. Luke records that Jesus, as a young 12-year-old boy, was living with his earthly father, Joseph, and mother in Nazareth. Jesus was taken to Jerusalem to the temple for his induction ceremony as a Jewish man. He stayed behind with the leaders of the temple, asking them questions, not knowing his parents had left for home. They assumed he was among relatives with whom they were traveling. When his parents found him, His response proved he was aware that Mary and Joseph were only his earthly parents given to him by God. Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house, he said? Small wonder, scripture records, they did not understand the statement which he made to them. But this same Jesus went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them." Luke 2, 50-51. Jesus obeyed his earthly mother and father. Could that be why Jesus found it possible to obey his heavenly father as well, even when it led to his death? It may seem strange to think that Jesus Christ, our Messiah, would have to learn obedience to his heavenly father, but that is what the Bible says. Hebrews 5, 8. Although he was a son... He learned obedience from the things which he suffered. There you have it, men. God's plan for the family, society, and the church requires each of us as sons to obey our parents, as adults to honor our father and mother. For a printed copy or a PDF of this program's teaching, or with any questions you may have, contact Dr. Jim by sending your email to menaliveuntogod at gmail.com. Men Alive is a production of Go Teach Global. For more information, go to our website at www.goteachglobal.com. Until next time, I'm your host, Paul Estabrooks, on behalf of Dr. Jim Cunningham, encouraging you to be men alive, conformed to the image of Jesus Christ.